Welcome to DealBook Debrief, America's place in a pandemic world. This event is sponsored by Accenture. As the health and humanitarian impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic evolve, so do the business and economic challenges. So how do today's CEOs turn these massive challenges into meaningful change? At Accenture, we are dedicated to helping our clients outmaneuver uncertainty in every industry, every day. This is the moment to reinvent business models and reintegrate the value organizations provide into a new societal landscape. The time to shape a mindset of bold business transformation powered by new approaches to technology and responsible leadership is underway. Good morning, it's Andrew Ross Sorkin, columnist at the New York Times and founder of DealBook. Welcome and thank you all uh, for joining us uh, on this week's DealBook Debrief. I'm joined as always by Michael Del Merced, uh, DealBook's intrepid reporter, uh, along this week with our special guest, Tom Friedman, um, the Renaissance man and opinion columnist, author, and just all things smart, uh, who's gonna try to help us uh, make some sense of the news uh, this morning. Uh, and there has been so much of it. Uh, before we get to Tom, I just wanna mention that this is an audio only event, so we're only in your ears. Uh, we should tell you that it's being recorded. We will make a replay available on DealBook uh, in the newsletter tomorrow morning on NewYorkTimes.com and on social media. And uh, as always, we want this to be as interactive a conversation as possible. So please, uh, you can start asking your questions uh, immediately uh, right there in the Q&A window. And then just one other quick note, starting next week, at least just for the week, I should say, we're gonna be doing an abbreviated version of DealBook as the team gets their first sort of uh, staycation pseudo week off uh, as <laughs> during this entire pandemic. So. Uh, will be a little bit shorter uh, than we have been in the past, but um, please keep opening the newsletter every morning. Uh, Tom, thanks for joining us this morning. Pleasure. Great to be with you, Andrew, and uh, with Michael. Uh, you know, when, when we planned on doing this, I had so many things that I, I thought we'd be talking about. I thought we'd talk about the tech hearings uh, that took place yesterday. I thought we'd talk about the China-U.S. relations, where we are in COVID, and so many, so many other issues, and I hope we get to those. But Literally, in the past two and a half hours, uh, there has been so much news, and I wanted to touch on virtually all of it with you because you always can offer a smart perspective on what we're seeing. Uh, President Trump out with a tweet this morning, effectively suggesting that the election should be delayed, the stock market dropping on that news this morning. A big question about what it would mean uh, if such a thing were to take place and whether a constitutional, what a constitutional crisis, what a constitutional crisis would look like. Then you had Secretary Pompeo coming out saying it would uh, be the decision of the Department of Justice. Uh, Herman Cain uh, passed away from COVID, literally uh, that announcement just in the past couple of hours. And then we got these uh, GDP and jobless claims numbers, uh, which were historic. And so I, I wanted to try to get to all of that with you if we could. Uh, and I imagine so much more that so many of the thousands of people who have joined us on this call this morning um, are trying to all understand. Um, I want to just let's start with let's start with Trump and uh, this tweet he writes this morning with universal mail-in voting not absentee voting which is good he says 2020 will be the most inaccurate and fraudulent election in history it'll be a great embarrassment to the USA delay the election until people can properly securely and safely vote question mark question mark question mark I think he'd probably like to put exclamation points next to it if he could what do you make of that well, you knew this was coming. The farther he falls behind, um, the more he's going to look for um, any way to avoid uh, judgment by the American people that he should be replaced. Let's just talk, though, technically, Andrew, about the situation. The, there's a few things that the Constitution is utterly clear about, and that is the power to set the election date uh, is with the Congress. That is with the House and the Senate. They've set that date as the first um, Tuesday in November. Uh, to change that date, the Senate and House, the Senate controlled by Republicans and the House controlled by Democrats, would have to agree uh, to delay the election. The Justice Department has nothing to do with this, okay? Um, it's entirely in the hands of Congress. There is zero chance that um, uh, they will agree to postpone the election, I would say, sitting here today at least. And so um, 
I, I put this both in the category of distraction. How better to distract from the fact that our GDP has fallen over 30%, um, that we have 40 million people out of work and, and now more growing, than um, to throw out um, the idea that uh, maybe we should just delay the election. So uh, this is the, you know, it, it's just sort of par for the course for this president. That's all I can tell you. Um, but I think if we do step back, Andrew, from a point of view of both politics and, and economics and the deal book listeners, um, this is part of the reason I began my column yesterday by saying that when people ask me how I feel, I feel like I'm a reporter for the Pompeii Daily News in 79 AD, and I'm sitting in the foothills of Mount Vesuvius, and someone just walked by and said, do you feel a rumbling? Because I feel a rumbling. When you look at um, the uncertainty now about whether people's uh, extraordinary unemployment benefits that were part of the first uh, bailout will be continued. When you see the number of businesses now who are reaching a point where, uh, I, a small item, Andrew, I noticed that Dunkin' Donut closed 800 stores this morning. Think about the jobs, the baking jobs, the service jobs around that. There's just a lot of businesses who have simply run the string that are gonna start to close. We have renters who don't know um, uh, now that uh, the um, uh, ban on evictions are, is, uh, is fading out, whether they'll have a, a place to live. And now the president has added that we um, can't be sure that we will have a free and fair election come November. That's a, a huge amount of molten anxiety now cursing through our society. And I don't rule out um, something extraordinary that the that the lid will blow off the place. You know, if you look at events like the demonstrations in Seattle and Portland and how they've continued well past um, the moment when the important points about Black Lives Matter uh, were being made, um, I think they're part of just a, this expression of free-floating anxiety uh, in the society right now um, uh, that's being fed by all these different sources. So that's, that's sort of my immediate reaction to the news. Let me, let me just dig in on the election issue for, for one more moment, because I think it could create a remarkable amount of uncertainty uh, for all of us. This is not just about the stock market. This is about the economy and about the country and, and about the world. While legally, the president may not be able to move the election, uh, despite uh, Secretary Pompeo's comment today, he was asked by Senator uh, Tim Kaine at a hearing and he said, in the end, the Department of Justice and others will make that le legal determination. But let's just assume that that is 100% inaccurate and wrong for the moment, which I think it is. The question is whether he could undermine enough confidence among Americans in the system, in the election system, that it creates its own conundrum. I think that's what he's out to do. Um, I think this is the first of what will be a campaign uh, between now and um, that will allow him. And the question is, you know, we always ask, is this the straw that breaks the camel's back that Republicans will break with him on? Um, and we've yet to meet that straw. Um, but the question is, is this the one? Because he is out to delegitimize this election that is out, that is showing all the signs. And I, I make no predictions, but as we sit here today and look at the polls, is out to delegitimize him and, and, and his um, uh, term as president. And uh, if there's one thing we've learned about Trump, um, he has no bottom. Um, he, uh, up to now, he has been a president um, without shame, uh, backed by a party without spine, backed by a media ecosystem without integrity. And um, we've never faced that onslaught um, uh, before as a country. And as you know, Andrew, you know, my politics is pretty centrist. I'm, I'm not, a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm I probably best be described as a pro-trade, pro-business, you know, moderate Democrat, you know, but um, this is code red. This is not about sort of left or right. This is about the fundamental rules of the game of our society. And, um, you know, I'm a Wednesday columnist, have been for almost all my 25 years. So that means I have the first column after every election. And um, uh, in the last election, it was really challenging because it went both ways. So first I had to write a column. First of all, my first column was tilted that Hillary might win, then it was neutral, then that Trump won. But I ended all three columns with the same quote. It was from a friend of mine, Leslie Goldwasser. She's an uh, immigrant uh, uh, from Zimbabwe. 
Um, actually, been here since the 70s. But Leslie had said to me one day, you know, you Americans kick around your country like it's a football, but it's actually not a football. It's a Fabergé egg. You can drop it. You can break it. And um, I, I really believe that. I think we're absolutely playing with fire. And, you know, everyone has their defining moment in journalism. My, my defining moment was I began my journalism career living inside a civil war in Lebanon. I actually saw uh, civilization fall apart, uh, a, a country fall apart. And that never left me. And um, uh, I am very afraid about what can happen here. If you've been, for people have been reading my column, you know, I've been raising, using the term code red for a while now. And um, uh, I think you people should absolutely rule out nothing. Well, let me ask you geopolitically, because you, you, you spend a lot of time when, when COVID is not taking place on an airplane, traveling around the world, uh, and oftentimes talking to, to global leaders. Outside of the United States, what do you think our allies want, to the degree we still have allies? And what do you think our rivals want? We were talking to David Sanger on a call just like this one last week, and we were talking about, you know, what China and Russia and Iran want out of this election, if in fact we need to worry about hacking. And it's a little less clear than it might have been four years ago. Well, um, it's a very good question. Obviously, our allies are praying that Biden will win and that we will restore the, um, you know, at least the basics of the Atlantic Alliance that has helped both shape and govern the world uh, you know, since the end of World War II. I think Russia and China are, will both be voting Trump in, uh, in, the, in the coming election. Even, even China, given, given the, at least the rhetoric, if not some of these, the, the trade tension which is escalated under Trump? Oh yeah, because I think they see Trump in two ways, both of them. They see Trump as someone, first of all, who keeps America in turmoil. So it'll never be able to realize its full potential as a competitor, but much more importantly, they know as long as Trump is president, he can never galvanize a global coalition against either of them. And what they both fear is a global coalition. In fact, China's officials retired. I did a column a couple of weeks ago in which I quoted one uh, from Bloomberg who um, basically said, we really hope Trump will win because as long as he's there, there can never be a global coalition against us. And that's the only thing that can possibly moderate China's behavior. So I, I think it's a short-sighted view. Um, uh, I don't think China benefits from an American turmoil. Um, and, uh, but I think that if I'm betting today, that's, that's what they're counting on. Let, let's put it this way, Andrew. They're not afraid of Trump um, uh, being reelected. I, I think they don't see him as a serious person. And, um, uh, and I think they feel they can navigate easily around him. Sticking with China for a moment, I don't know how much of yesterday's tech hearings you caught but when we, when we look at the big tech companies in the United States, one of the things you hear from tech giants and tech leaders is we need to have big tech companies here in the United States and be really successful because if we don't, China is going to eat our lunch. And you'll hear Facebook talk about the you know, TikTok, for example, uh, or others. And, and at one moment in, in the hearings, all four uh, CEOs were asked whether they had, whether they had experience uh, with China stealing from them. And you had a very sort of mixed answer. Uh, Tim Cook said no. Of course, Tim Cook and Apple do a huge amount of business uh, in China. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg said yes. Um, you heard Jeff Bezos said no, at least not for Amazon itself, though he clearly seemed to imply or indicate that he recognized that there was counterfeiting and other things happening to maybe some of the people on or, and firms that, that use his uh, platform. And then Sundar Pashai of Google uh, originally said no, oddly enough, and then corrected himself and said yes. What is your sense right now of this, this competition question with China? Is that a red herring? Are, 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 the, are, the, US Chinese com are the U.S. companies using China a as a way of, of, of maintaining their size and scale? Uh, is, that a, is that a real argument, not a real argument? What do you think? Well, it's complicated. I would say two things, Andrew. One is first, let's ask the question, how did China get rich? China got rich over the last 40 years. It went from poverty to middle income. I would say using four strategies. The first was hard work and delayed gratification. You just have to take your hat off that. Second was smart investments in infrastructure. The bullet train from 
Beijing to Shanghai is four hours. Our bullet train from New York to Chicago, roughly the same distance, is 22 hours. Third was deep and broad investments in education. You really have to give them credit for that. And fourth was stealing other people's intellectual property, non-reciprocal trade arrangements, forced technology transfers, and non-compliance with WTO rulings against them. So that's why it's not a simple question. If people think China just got rich by cheating and stealing, um, that would be wrong, especially today's China. If people think China didn't get here by cheating and stealing and isn't continuing to do that, uh, they should look at what China's version of the F-35 looks like, our F-35, our most advanced aircraft, because it looks exactly like ours. Now, isn't that a coincidence? So uh, on, on the one hand, you, you've, you've got that dilemma. And, and that's what, that's why, you know, my view was, um, there have been a few things I've supported President Trump on. My, my view is that President Trump is not the American president America deserves, but he is the American president that China deserves. That we needed an American president who would, who would call them out on some of these things. Unfortunately, he did it in, in a totally inept way. But going forward, um, uh, I think the thing that, Pompeo and others who threaten China do not understand is um, China today has a lot of incredibly innovative companies. Um, uh, they may have started by stealing and cheating, but a lot of them, TikTok being an example, uh, are extremely innovative, uh, Huawei being another. And um, uh, more importantly, if you are a big American tech company, um, you have to be in the China market now to, to have the scale and the kind of innovative edge you're going to need to compete globally. And by the way, if you're not there and say your Korean and Japanese competitors are there, not to mention your Chinese competitors, think of the advantage they're going to have in terms of competition and just raw scale that they're in the China market and you're not. Now, you've got companies like Google and Facebook that are so big and are able to get so big ex-China, um, they're, they're exceptions, but that's certainly not true of, say, a Qualcomm, you know. And, um, uh, and so the idea that we can enter a kind of cold war with China, that we're just going to exit their market. But Pompeo and these people, because I don't think they really know China very well, this is a big, powerful country. It's a big, powerful, and innovative country today. And um, uh, the fact is, I do believe Xi Jinping has overplayed his hand. I do believe, though, America has also underperformed. And the way to respond to China is with a combination of getting our own act together more, but also building a global coalition to deal with China's misbehavior and making it the world against China on the right and fair rules of the road for trade, not Trump against Xi, which only triggers a nationalist populist backlash there. Well, let me also then ask you about the rules of the road right here domestically. And I should also just thank everybody. We, we've got so many thousands of people on this call and uh, asking questions. We, I promise you we'll get to them, but I would also encourage you to con continue to send more uh, in right now, and we'll, 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 we're going to try to uh, group them and uh, get them to Tom in just, in just a little bit. But domestically, there's a view, as you probably know, that the, the, the four uh, big tech companies, and maybe at uh, Microsoft and a couple of the others, are, are they the, the modern day versions of Standard Oil? Are, are, the, are the individuals who were uh, sitting in front of, uh, of, of Congress yesterday the new emperors, uh, as, as one congressman said? Yeah, I think that's a really important question. I think the fact that Facebook, that one person, because uh, Facebook is controlled by one person, controls Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp, uh, that's a travesty. That never should have happened. That is too much power in the hands of one person, Mark Zuckerberg, as far as I'm concerned. And I would love to see Facebook broken up. Um, uh, you know, Google, um, um, it's a different, question for me, uh, only because I, I benefit from Google so much. Um, uh, but I, I would be ready and open to listening to any antitrust um, uh, cases against them or Amazon. I mean, Amazon is just so big. And again, it's what's new in this world is that you know, usually you have monopolies that raise prices. They, they use their monopoly power to lower prices seemingly in some areas, but actually raise them in others. But much more importantly, and this did come out in the hearing, Andrew, it's what does their size do to innovation? What happens in a society where an economy 
where you have these four giant companies that nip in the bud, that buy up any competitor, as Facebook did with Instagram and WhatsApp. Um, the minute they rear their head, and they have so much money that they can absolutely you know, pay gazillions of dollars more than anybody else. And, and what is that doing to the innovation ecosystem in this country? And so I think that's where we really need some, some real serious discussion and innovation around antitrust law. So it, it, it's, um, Lord knows, Amazon just keeps driving down prices and, and, and increasing delivery and you, you sit on the face of it and say, hey, this is great for me. But I think what we're missing is what they're doing to the innovation ecosystem of this country. Let me ask you this, how much of it is the need to break them up versus perhaps regulating them, meaning making it harder for them now to make acquisitions? Um, you know, it's very difficult, I think in fairness, I remember when Facebook bought Instagram at the time, some people thought it was a great deal. Some people thought that Mark Zuckerberg was crazy to spend a billion dollars and it was unclear whether it would be a success. And, and so, from a legal perspective, do we need to change the frame? But when it comes to innovation, one of the other questions that relates to this is, you know, you go back and look 20 years ago, and I, I went and did the math, uh, so I'll, I'll tell the audience. 20 years ago, the top 10 biggest companies in the world started with Microsoft, General Electric, Cisco, Exxon, Walmart, Intel, NTT, Lucent Technologies, Nokia, remember Nokia? and British Petroleum. The only one 20 years later that's still on that list, if you can believe it, is Microsoft. Right now it's Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, Alphabet, which was never on that list, Facebook, Berkshire Hathaway, Alibaba, Tencent, Visa, Johnson & Johnson. And so the question is, 20 years from now, what you think that list looks like? Uh very hard to predict, but I, I would simply say to your point, I, I, um, I would certainly entertain the idea of, of you know, putting regulatory limits on them right now. Um, I think the idea of maybe, you know, outside of Facebook, where I see a very clear, easy way to do this, um, breaking them up becomes uh, a much more a difficult exercise. And it's, it's not only in and of itself, Andrew, it's because of the asymmetry in knowledge today between regulators and innovators. You know, in the old world, uh, you government regulated, we innovators innovated. Um, but there was less of a gap between the two. I mean, now let's go back to Orrin Hatch asking Mark Zuckerberg, uh, Mr. Zuckerberg, if you give your product away for free, how do you make money? So the, the, the regulator <clears throat> had no clue how the innovator even made money. Um, and these companies are going deeper and deeper and deeper and faster and faster and faster. Um, it's one of the, 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 the things I've been pointing out, you know, um, uh, that have you noticed how we suddenly used the word deep, uh, applied it to everything? Nobody ordered it, but suddenly it's deep fake, deep mind, deep research, deep medicine, deep technology. And it's because we intuit that these companies are, especially in the last five years, have been able to touch things at a depth, a depth of precision that um, we've just never seen before. And the ability for regulators to keep up with that um, is getting more and more challenging. And so how you develop different kind of ecosystems approach to regulation. You know, if you remember, Andrew, we had these uh, leaked emails from Boeing, Boeing engineers. And one of them I plucked out, it was really one of my favorites. It's a Boeing engineer and he's talking about his FAA regulator. And he basically says, uh, this isn't an exact quote, but it's pretty close. He said, you know, my FAA regulator is like so clueless essentially about what I'm doing. Right. Mm -hmm. Watching him watching me is like watching dogs watching television. So we have, we have a real problem here between the, the, the speed at which these companies can go, the depth at which they can go, and mm -hmm. our ability to regulate them. And so I think we're gonna to have to find a very different model, maybe a much more of an ecosystem model. Um, what does that look like? Well, think of the New York Times after we got rid of a whole layer of copy editors. You know what I do when my column goes up now? I look at the comments for the first mm -hmm. time. And I look at the comments, I'm curious always what people say, but I'm much more looking at the comments to see if I uh, spelled Andrew Ross Sorkin right. with not an I. Because if I do, I know that one of the commenters basically will point that out. In other words, we, we have turned our 
we have crowdsourced our, our editing a little bit and our fact checking. And I think these kind of very different solutions, not the kind of 1950s, you know, uh, 60s approach to monopoly will probably be something that's, that's required. If I were a young lawyer today, this is a field I'd be really interested in. Okay, well, I want to hand it over to Michael because I know he's got so many questions, but I have one final question uh, before, before uh, I hand the mic over to him, which is Herman Cain, as you know, just died. Uh, it was just announced in the last couple of hours. And I, I, I know that there, politically, there are people who sadly will be gleeful about this. I think it's, it's a tragedy and it, it's sad. Uh, but, I'm, but I'm curious what you think the implications will be, what the lessons uh, in his death will be. Obviously, nobody knows uh, whether he contracted COVID at that Tulsa rally. But of course, there are, you know, you go on Twitter and uh, people are, you know, talking about irresponsibility and this and that. But we haven't really touched on COVID and where we are. And I just wanted to get your, your final thoughts before uh, we get to so many questions. And I know they're waiting, so we'll do it quick. Well, you know, I'll just get, share with the audience just very quickly how I've approached the whole COVID story from the very beginning. Um, and um, I think you and I talked about this a little, maybe it's on Squawk, but, um, uh, you know, the people I have relied on uh, in this um, uh, pandemic, the, my sources, actually are people um, I came to know in writing a book about the natural world called Hot, Flat, and Crowded back in 2008. Um, why is that? What, my, my point at the very beginning is that to think clearly and intelligently about this crisis, you have to be in the mindset of natural systems. Um, yeah. and not a lot of people are. And so, um, uh, you know, basically, this is the first time, Andrew, that all of us collectively, simultaneously around the world are in the grip of Mother Nature, are in the grip of one of Mother Nature's fastballs. And the fastballs are what Mother Nature throws at us. They're called germs and viruses and floods and droughts and, um, uh, and, and hurricanes and tornadoes and forest fires. These are the things she throws at her plant and animal species to sort out who is the fittest, who shall get their DNA into the next generation. And when she does that, when she throws these fastballs, um, what does she reward? What is the behavior that she rewards? She does not reward the strongest. She does not reward the smartest. She only rewards the most adaptive. That's who she rewards of her plant and animal species. Now, she asks you just three questions in terms of your adaptation st strategy. First, she asks you, are you humble? Do you respect my virus? Because if you don't, it will hurt you or someone you love. Second, she asks, are you coordinated in your response to my virus, both individually and collectively, because I've evolved my virus over millennia to find any crack in your immune system, your individual one, or your communal one. And third, she asks, have you built your adaptation strategy on chemistry, biology, and physics? Because that's all I am. I'm just chemistry, biology, and physics. So if you've built your adaptation strategy on politics, ideology, and an election schedule, not on chemistry, biology, and physics, I will hurt you or someone you love. And the problem with Trump from the very beginning is that he is completely alienated from natural systems. His only experience with natural systems is building golf courses, where he actually thought he could triumph over nature. If you've played on his courses, you'll know he builds waterfalls. But he has no feel for natural systems. And therefore, if you think of those three adaptation strategies, he's actually violated all three. He does not respect the virus. He has not um, promoted coordination. And he's built his adaptation strategy, not on chemistry, biology, and physics, but politics, ideology, and his re-election campaign. Okay. Uh, with that, Tom, thank you so much for the conversation. Uh, we have, as I said, thousands of people on this call, and they have lots of questions for you. And I'm going to hand it over uh, to Michael, who is uh, going to navigate through them. Michael. Thanks, Andrew. And thank you, Tom. This has been really informative. Um, we have so many really good questions. I'd like to actually start with one from Bill. Who's asked, who asks basically, how do you see the virus sort of playing out right now, given the course that we're on? How does this end? How does the economic downturn end? How does the US emerge from this? Where do you think we end up? Well, I'll just pick up where I left off there, Michael, to answer this question. If you, so from the very beginning, um, had we had our thinking caps on, um, 
had the president convened a meeting of the top experts in the country and asked this question, what do you do in a pandemic? What's the right thing to do? Um, the, the right answer would have been, well, you need a strategy. You need a sustainable strategy for maximally saving both lives and livelihoods. And by the way, when you're up against mother nature, there's going to be a trade-off, okay? So how do we save the most lives and the most livelihoods at the same time? Because if all you do is, is lock down the economy to save every life, you will create um, so much unemployment, as we've seen, that you will have so many more deaths of despair over time of people who lost jobs and futures and businesses and hopes and dreams. If you just focus on the economy and ignore the power of the virus, uh, it will hurt you and someone you love and it will multiply and multiply without stop. So we needed a strategy to do both. Now, if you look around the world, and this was my argument from the very beginning, I was one of the very first people back in March who, who basically said, hey, we need a strategy to do both. Now, if you look at around the world, you see three different models. You see a China model that says, we're gonna use all the tools of the Chinese surveillance state, tools we've created to actually control our people to try to control COVID-19 um, and, um, uh, and then wait for a, uh, uh, to get herd immunity through a vaccine. That's been the China strategy and they've done it pretty well. Uh, they say they've had, I think, less than 5,000 deaths. Let's say they're not telling the truth, double it. They've had 10,000, triple it, 15,000, still a tenth of what we've had, okay? Then there's democratic versions of the China kind of lockdown strategy, South Korea, Germany done it very well, others less so. Second approach was Sweden. Um, and I've been writing about them from the very beginning because Sweden said, basically, let's, let's maximize saving lives and livelihoods by um, sending some kids to school, but not all, closing high schools and universities. Let's send some people to work. Let's encourage social distancing and let's protect our most vulnerable. But let's actually let our least vulnerable, the young and healthy, actually acquire the disease naturally and develop herd immunity that way. Now, Sweden will tell you they did a terrible job of protecting their most vulnerable uh, in the nursing homes. But um, uh, if you follow Sweden, you'll know, boy, that, that story has turned in the last few days because um, uh, Sweden's economy has been bouncing back. Their rates of um, a virus spread have been going down. And all their neighbors who are looking on them with contempt just a few weeks ago are actually facing a different problem. Now, I, what I've learned about this virus is be humble about it. Sweden could look different two weeks from now. There's so much we don't know, but I watched the Sweden story. It's a different approach to herd immunity. The third approach has been the American approach. Let's talk like we're locking down like China. Let's act actually like we're gonna just go for herd immunity like Sweden. Let's prepare for neither and let's claim to be superior to both. That's basically been Trump's approach. And it gives you the mess we've got right now. Now, what is terrifying to me is not only does this virus continue to spread um, uh, uh, in these states that have done, that basically locked down haphazardly and then opened haphazardly, but um, we're going into the fall. And there's, there's just one thing the research screams at us, which is that this virus spreads most in closed rooms. So it, whether it's families that are unable to social distance or people who are reckless and don't social distance and gather indoors, in restaurants, in closed rooms. And remember, the virus kind of hit us in March. So right as spring was coming and we could be more outdoors, I really fear what happens when we enter the fall, when people won't be able to be outdoors, when it'll be just so much more difficult for some people to social distance. Um, and that's why, Michael, I pray every night for a vaccine. Um, because it's clear that we, at least in America, we're just not up to this. We're, we're just not up for this. We, we don't have an efficient enough government and we don't have a rule abiding enough society uh, to take on this pandemic. And um, the only thing that's gonna save us is a vaccine that um, begins to be distributed uh, in October, November, I pray. A reader has sent a follow-up question um, along those lines, which is how do you think both the American people and people around the world adapt to these sort of challenges, especially on the technology front? Are we gonna be set back collectively? Is this going to really amplify inequality and access to opportunity? What, what other sort of challenges do you think we now face uh, now that we're even deeper into this pandemic? I think you'll see everything in its opposite, but um, let, me, let me start from 30,000 feet and then drill down on what I mean by that. Um, I think that we are on the cusp 
of a period of creative destruction um, that may be um, one of the most massive, amazing, creative, and destructive periods of human history. Think about where we are. Think about the number of people, and you and Andrew have been writing about this for years, who now have cheap distributed tools of innovation. Think about the number of people who now have access to the most powerful computing in the world for pennies through the cloud. Think of the people now who have access to money that is basically free, zero interest rates. And think of the different problems and challenges now facing the world in every direction. The number of innovators with cheap tools and access to cloud computing and free money applying their brains to this challenge is going to be phenomenal. I'll just give you the tiniest of examples. We have a Chinese restaurant here. I live in Bethesda, Maryland. We've been going to for 30 years. When the pandemic started in March and the lockdown, I thought, well, let's go order takeout from them. I want to make sure we support them. I went to online the website, called it up. The takeout menu is really crude. Um, two weeks later, I went back to order some more um, Mugu Gai Pan, and their takeout menu was unbelievable. Just in two weeks, how they had improved their menu. Do you want to put your license plate in here? We'll walk it out. Delivery. I mean, it was just amazing. It's a tiny and silly example, but that's happening everywhere. And it's going to happen even more. And it's going to create new opportunities. And it's going to create new challenges for everybody. I, I can't even predict how it's going to come out. But we are going to see innovation on steroids. And it is going to be a period of incredible creativity and incredible destruction, particularly on how we work and where we work. All right, we've got a lot of questions uh, on China, Tom. Um, and I'm, one from anonymous listener asks, um, how widely is uh, uh, Secretary Pompeo's view about uh, engaging with China in a confrontational way? How, how, how widely accepted is that by policymakers at large? Which sort of ties into a related question, uh, which is if Biden wins, is that going to be, is that approach going to carry forward or is it going to change? Are we going to take a different tack to China? I find what's scary about Pompeo's view, um, again, I'm, I'm in the view that we had to draw some red lines with China. Um, but I think Pompeo is out for something else with China and Iran. Um, I think he's out for regime change. I think these guys actually want to bring down, in fact, if you listen to them, they basically said that. They want to bring down the Communist Party. Well, you know, I've learned a couple of things the hard way, actually, um, Michael. Um, one is about the, the Middle East, and the other would be about China. Um, uh, in the Middle East, one of the things I've learned is the opposite of autocracy in the Middle East is not democracy. It's disorder. So you want to see real disorder in the Middle East? You, you try to bring down the Iranian regime. You, you collapse the regime in Iran. And believe me, I'm no friend of this regime at all. Uh, I want it changed. But um, you, you try to topple that regime, um, you will see Iraq and Syria on steroids, because this is a big country. It's 80 million people. Iraq kind of imploded. Iran would explode. Um, and as far as China is concerned, um, again, the idea of actually trying to topple the Communist Party, um, well, you know, first of all, you might want to talk to some Chinese about that, because a lot of Chinese, they have a lot of complaints about the Communist Party, but they appreciate the order and they appreciate the progress that it has delivered, even if they can't write an op-ed piece in the Wall Street Journal. So be very careful about that. But more importantly, I actually don't like to use the term China. I much prefer one-sixth of humanity. That gives you the real scale of what, what we're talking about. Don't, don't play around with one-sixth of humanity. If you want to create change there, you do it by creating a broad alliance and making it the world versus China on the rules of the road um, and not try to topple the government there. These guys are really playing uh, with fire, I believe. And um, uh, you know, people say that Trump is bad at creating alliances, Trump and Pompeo. Actually, I have to disagree. They just created an amazing alliance between Iran and China, um, who have now announced a, a big partnership. And um, uh, so, you know, when you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. And um, uh, I have zero confidence um, in the ability of these people to, to see the world and navigate it in the American interest. 
And so a follow-up, Tom, then. So if Biden were to win in November, how do you think that approach would change? Um, I think that Biden is much more likely to um, uh, settle on an approach, Michael, that I think is the right approach, um, which is how I would have approached China in the trade talks. How I would approach them is I would have signed the Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership deal, uh, a deal that basically modernized the trade rules uh, for the 21st century based on American interests, um, uh, uh, based on American um, uh, priorities, uh, and included with uh, uh, our other uh, 12 partners, 40% of global GDP. I'd have gotten them on my side around my rules. Then I would have gone to the Europeans and said, you guys have the same problem we have. Um, uh, and so I'd have gotten another basically 35, 40% of global GDP on my side. Then I would have called up the Chinese and said, let's negotiate. We're going to do it all in secret. I don't want to embarrass you at all. We're, you send your guys to Hainan Island, we'll send our guys. But just know I'm coming with my friends, 80% of global GDP. And in private, we're going to nail you. Um, uh, and we're going to make this the world against you on the right rules of the road. Now, what happens when you approach them that way? What, you, what happens is you actually leverage all the reformers inside China, and they are many, something, again, the Pompeos in the world don't understand, who actually would like to see change in their system as well. When it's the world against China, you leverage them. When it's Trump versus Xi over who has the biggest tariff, then you turn it into a nationalist fight, and um, uh, you get nowhere. And, and we basically have gotten nowhere here. We've made very, very little progress. And we always are stronger when we make it the world versus China. Um, because, you know, remember, there's a whole new generation of Chinese looking at Xi Jinping and saying, hey, I actually like having my kid in school at Ohio State. Um, I actually like traveling to America. My, my brother, my cousin is already there. I don't like where this is going where I can't go out anymore, I can't travel anymore, I can't send my kid anymore. And so we, we, there's a lot of forces we can leverage there, but you have to be smart and you have to be nuanced. You know, it's the same with Iran. Again, if I were, you know, Trump's always tweeting, but you never understand, you know, if I were, if I were trying to move the Iranians, um, what I would have done is uh, Trump broke the uh, Iran deal. Okay, he said it was a bad deal. What I would have then come back with is with a counteroffer. I would have said to the Iranians, Okay, uh, under the old deal, you know, you had to, you were able to sort of, you had to give up your nuclear potential for 15 years to build a weapon. Um, we want to double that. We're going to take it to 30 years. And we're going to add that you cannot test any long range missiles. Now, if we had put that on the table, not, not, not basically regime change, if we just put that little deal on the table, you have to go for 30 years of non-nuclear and, and no um, uh, uh, missiles, you would have created a huge fight in Tehran. Oh my God, the fight that would have broken out there inside the regime with people saying, look, we're, we're being, all our oil income's been completely sanctioned. We got to accept this deal. Other people saying, no, we, we made it so easy when we just say, no, it's regime change. You guys are gone. Tell us when you leave, then, then we'll ease up. And, and this gets back to the core problem of the Trump administration. President Trump is a political coward. He has based his entire politics on holding his base. And because he is obsessed with holding his base of 30%, he can never actually do a deal where you have to move to the center and compromise and tell the base they're going to have to give something up. Remember what happened when we almost had a, a deal around immigration, uh, uh, building a wall plus you know, dealing with um, the 11 million undocumented here. There was a deal to be had there. And what happened? And Coulter came out and tweeted against Trump and Laura Ingram and all these other knuckleheads. Um, and what does he do? That, that Trump was abandoning the base. So he abandons the deal. Well, you cannot do a real deal with China without a compromise where you have to say to the base, yeah, I wanted 100%, but I only got 75%. But that's still pretty good. You can't do that on immigration. You can't do it on taxes. You can't do it on China. You can't do it on Iran. And that's why this regime, this administration, has been fantastic at breaking things. From Obamacare, you know, to the Iran deal, to the climate deal, to TPP, they are fantastic at breaking things, even breaking corporate taxes, which I agreed with. But they can't build anything, because to build things, you require a majority, and that means telling the extremes on the left and the right, including your own base, they have to compromise. And at the end of the day, Trump has never had the political courage to do that. That's why he will leave office. I hope and pray, in case you've not been reading my column, let me make that very clear. I hope and pray. And there won't be a bloody bridge named after this guy in this country. Because if you actually look at what he's built, 
he has built absolutely nothing. To, to be a builder, you have to forge a coalition, and that means compromising, and he is utterly incapable of doing that. And if you want to know what I really think, just read my column. Uh, Tom, uh, there have been, uh, there's a lot of readers, including Ore, who've asked um, the, a version of this question, which seems like a natural follow-up, which is, a lot of what the Trump administration has done, it seems like, is really strained globalization. Can it be put back together? I, I, is it working in any sort of capacity now, and is there any path for it to be revived? Really good question. So, um, the... Of the, of the lessons I've learned as a journalist in 40 years, the one I've learned the hard way most is um, I, the things I've regretted most are any column or news story that I began with the phrase, the world will never be the same again. <laughs> um, so people, I've heard this about globalization ever since I wrote The World is Flat in 2005. There's a whole bunch of books out there. The world is not flat, it's spiky, it's lumpy, it's blah, blah, blah. Guess what, folks? It's flatter than ever. Because when it comes to globalization, I am a technological determinist. Um, what I mean by that is if people have a cell phone that for zero marginal cost allows them to have suppliers all over the world, customers all over the world, employees all over the world, they're gonna find a way to use that cell phone to do that. Now politics can and will interrupt and get in the way sometimes. There's no question about it. And we're in one of those moments. Um, but I do believe the technology is not just interconnecting the world. It's not actually making the world interdependent. It's now doing what my teacher and friend Dove Seidman calls, it's actually fusing us together. So what I am not a determinist about is what people will do with the technology, uh, whether they use it for good or ill. That's a whole nother question. But I do believe, I would not bet against these technologies fusing us together. Um, we're, we're, we're in one of these two steps forward, one step back moment. But ultimately, um, I think we'll, globalization, the necessity of it, the opportunity of it, the logic of it and the technological ability to do it will in the end win out. Um, but that's not to say there won't be step backwards, steps backward, and I think we're in one of them right now. I, I, there are so many other, so many other reader questions we could ask, there are a ton of them, but I think we're running close to time. So Andrew, I'll toss it back to you. Another reason to have Tom back soon. Thank you, uh, Michael, for those great questions. And Tom, thank you. Uh, for all of your perspective and insight. It is a, a privilege to spend time with you for all of us. And you have been a great friend over all these years. And we love uh, talking to you uh, on these occasions and hope we can do it again very soon. Uh, for those of you out there listening uh, now who may have missed any part of this, uh, we'll make a replay available uh, on nytimes.com and the Tomorrow's Dealbook newsletter and on social media. Pass it around to your friends if you like. Uh, we should also note that there's an event happening later today with my other great friend, David Leonhardt, uh, who's going to be doing a call with uh, um, the former Labor Secretary, uh, Robert Reich, and uh, also the head of the Domestic Workers Alliance. And then we should tell you next week, you don't want to miss it, we're going to do a call with Nicole Hannah-Jones, uh, the founder of the 1619 Project, recent Pulitzer Prize winner. We're going to talk about racial injustice in corporate America. It's an important conversation and we hope that you will join us. Thank you so very much. Michael, thank you. Tom, thank you. Uh, thank you all for joining us uh, on this call and for your great questions. Please stay safe, healthy, and sane, and we'll uh, see you and talk to you next week. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew.